so I made an offer on a house and it was accepted. Yay! I've had the home inspection and the appraisal. Now it's time for closing. But my realtor says that we are closing at a title company. What's a title company? They say I need title insurance, but what's title insurance? Do I really need title insurance? What's the difference between a standard policy of title and an enhanced title policy? What does this title insurance cost and are there other expenses with my closing? What's a split closing? These are just some of the questions that I'm going to ask our guest today. I'm Eric Hutchinson and I'm the principal broker and owner of Hutchinson Realty. Welcome to episode 12 of Real Estate Talk for Northwest Arkansas. I have my co-host Cole with me today and we have some special guests today. So welcome friends. I have already introduced myself so let's go around the table and let the listeners know who's here. Hey guys, I'm Cole Eady, realtor here with Hutchinson Realty. I've been a realtor for almost a year now, and I've lived in Northwest Arkansas for almost five years. Hey, Cole. Hi, I'm Jennifer Holmstrom, and I've been with Waco Title for five years and have been living in Northwest Arkansas for the last eight. Hey, Jennifer. Hi, I'm Angelina, and I'm a closing agent with Waco Title Company. I've been with them for a little over a year now, um, and I am a two-year resident of Northwest Arkansas. Hey, Angelina. Welcome, guys. So glad that you decided to join our podcast today. I'm really excited about our topic. But before we get into our topic, I always have Cole do our weather report. It's not really weather, but it's real estate weather. And so, Cole, tell us how many houses are for sale in Northwest Arkansas. Thank you so much, Eric. Well, guys, as of today, June 6, 2023, there are currently uh, 1,488 homes for sale in Benton and Washington counties, which is a decrease of 36 homes from this time last week when we had our podcast. However, today, I'm only going to go over the six largest towns. And so first, I'm going to start with Bella Vista. Bella Vista currently has 184 homes for sale, 97 are new, and 87 are resale. The median list price is 411000 411, and the price per square foot is $199. Next, we're going to do Bentonville. Bentonville currently has 177 homes for sale, 64 are new, and 113 are resale. The median list price is 569000 and the price per square foot is $219. Next, we will do Centerton. Centerton currently has 101 homes for sale. 80 are new and 21 are resale. The median list price is 429,000 and the price per square foot is $202. Next, we will do Rogers. Rogers currently has 154 homes for sale, 33 are new and 121 are resale. The median list price is 539,000 and the price per square foot is $217. Next, we will do Springdale. Springdale currently has 113 homes for sale, 36 are new, and 77 are resale. The median list price is $465,000, and the price per square foot is $194. And next, we will do Fayetteville. Fayetteville currently has 198 homes for sale, 72 are new, and 126 are resale. The median list price is $477,000, and the price per square foot is $208. And finally, with all towns, there are currently 927 homes for sale, 382 are new, and 545 are resale. The median list price is $475,000, and the price per square foot is $205. Hey, Cole, thank you so much. It's really interesting to me to see how our economy has, even though economy is adjusting, it doesn't seem like our prices have really adjusted a whole lot in about the last eight or nine months. This time last year, we kind of reached a peak in the summer months. In fact, I was sharing in our sales meeting that Rogers had 16 houses that sold over a million dollars. And three of those were over $2 million. And so it kind of skews our data a little bit whenever I'm looking at the Rogers data. But man, there's just not a lot of affordable housing. It's just incredible to see that. And our inventories keep going down. I'll, I'll, last week, we actually went down in the amount of houses from last week to this week. But the week before last, we had actually gone up a few houses. We're like, yay, it's finally starting to increase. But then 
uh, they fell back down this week. So anyway, it's still a seller's market, but we're still not seeing a lot of multiple offers because of how high the prices are. So uh, speaking of prices and you know buyers looking for homes, I'm going to go over just uh, real briefly the int uh, the interest rates, the mortgage interest rates. I looked these up this morning, and uh, we're still uh, 7.375 for a conventional 30-year fixed loan. And a 15 year fixed is a 6.375. An FHA 30 year is 6.75. And a VA 30 year is 6.75. So we have not seen a lot of break in our interest rates, which really in, impacts our market. If the interest rates would go down, it would really uh, you know, help to sell our homes even faster. But they have remained high. And the higher they go, if they get up back up around 8%, then we're going to probably see some prices go down and we'll probably see uh, it taking longer to sell a house. So anyway, that's kind of, uh, if you want to call it the real estate weather report and what's going on. So let's get into our topic. I've got some guests here with us today. I'm really excited to have Waco Title with us and we're going to be talking about title insurance. Now, we all know what that is here at this table, but the average listener until they buy a house, they probably have never really heard of title insurance. And even if they have purchased one or two houses in their lifetime, they usually forget. Now, what is title insurance? So I'm. let's give our listeners a running definition. So Angelina, I'm going to go to you here. Why don't you just uh, give us a little bit of what what is title insurance? Why does a buyer need that? And if you've got any stories of anyone who maybe, you know, uh, stumbled into your office and said, hey, I bought this house, you know, using a quick claim deed or something, but now uh, I realize I need to hit title insurance. So anyway, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about title insurance? Yeah, absolutely. So title insurance protects your property rights for as long as you or your heirs own the home. So it protects against any defects that may have come up, um, and it assures that you have received clear title for your property. Um, so we've had people come in before that are wanting to sell their home. They purchased it with a quick claim deed, didn't get title insurance, and there's outstanding interest on the property. So we're having to go back two to three owners ago who didn't properly deed out of the property. Um, and we have to go back, find these individuals. Um, if they're deceased, we have to find their heirs for them to deed out so we can issue clear title to that new owner. Yeah, so let me ask you a question in relation to that. And I'm kind of, I know that I've told you guys what order I was going to ask the questions, but uh, you already mentioned quick claim deed. So for someone who doesn't know what a quick claim deed is, explain that. So a quick claim deed is just a deed that transfers the property. There's not been a title search done. There's no title insurance involved. It's just a deed transferring property from one individual to another. Yeah. So I had a deal years ago where I had a buyer and we were buying, the buyer wanted to buy this new construction house and it was a beautiful home. It was already completed. And so we were moving forward. Well, the builder bought the lot that he built the house on from his uncle and his uncle said, Hey, here's this lot and you can have it. And so, you know, Bill was like, great. He took it and they did a quick claim deed and they just transferred ownership. Now I don't need any title insurance or anything like that. So anyway, my buyer was moving forward. We had sent all the stuff over to the title company and the title company gave me a call back in a few days and said, um, there is a $40,000 lien against this. And what had happened was the uncle had gotten behind on some debt and some other things. And so then the, the creditors or whoever um, put a lien on that lot for $40,000. And so whenever they did a quick claim deed over to the builder, he inherited that debt. And now my buyer is like, well, I don't want to inherit the debt and sorry. And it killed the deal, killed the whole deal. We had to go find another house for them be all because the builder took the lot from an uncle, quit claim deed, and then built a house on it. Now he's got this house and a $40,000 debt on it. So anyway, you know, interesting. And to your point there, there's certainly a reason why we need a title insurance. So absolutely. Yeah. So Cole, I think you had a question. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so what kind of title policy do you guys give as a default? And also, will you explain the difference between a standard policy and an enhanced title policy and then the cost difference? Okay, so it depends on the property of what we default to. 
Um, so when talking about a basic and an enhanced policy, if it's a primary residence, one to four family dwelling, it has to be purchased or owned by an individual or a trust, we automatically do default to an enhanced policy because we want your asset to be as insured and covered as much as we possibly can. Um, investment properties, we default more so towards a basic policy. They don't offer the enhanced policy for that. Um, for an enhanced policy, it covers a little bit more, of course, than the basics. So the enhanced covers access. It covers survey issues, zoning issues. If there are types of structural removals, so let's say somebody decides to build a shed on your property later on, we cover those legal costs to take care of that type of situation. So for the cost, excuse me, for the cost of that, so if you're looking at a $100,000 purchase, which of course is not something common that we're looking at today, um, your basic policy is going to cost roughly around $365. Your enhanced policy is roughly going to cost about $458 and some change. Of course, depending on the underwriter that is used. So, I mean, you're looking at maybe a $50 to $100 difference. Of course, if the purchase price is increased, there could be an increased difference in that. That's kind of what you're looking at. So that's really interesting. Um, you know, I don't think most people know that there is a standard and an enhanced. And I will tell you, we do a lot of closings. I know you guys do as well, but we do a lot of closings every year and many times with other title companies. Sorry that we don't always use you. And it's not us really. It's our client that has the choice. But I will tell you that sometimes other title companies only give a standard policy. That's just what they do standard. And you have to remember to ask for an enhanced policy. So I think it's really awesome that you guys give an enhanced by default on a, you know, residential property that's not investment or trust. I think that's really awesome because there is, and I know that the listeners can't see this sheet that I'm looking at, but holy cow, there's got to be at least 15 items here that the enhanced policy covers that the standard does not. And so I kind of want to ask you, Angelina, you had mentioned the, um, you know, we talked earlier before the podcast about encroachment. And so I had a, a buyer, uh, actually it wasn't a buyer. I had a seller walk into my front door. This has been several years ago. And he said, Hey, I used one of your agents to buy this house. It was a new construction house whenever I bought it. But whenever I did, um, I didn't, you know, I didn't get an enhanced policy or I didn't get a survey or any of that stuff because the builder supposedly did a survey and I just trusted it. Well, it's been years now. I want to sell my house now, but as I put my house up for sale, the guy who owns the lot next door told me that my retaining wall, uh, which was around the air conditioning unit or something was actually encroaching on his property. And so that was never disclosed to me and all this stuff. And so, you know, what do I do? So let's go back. Let's say that the, the, the guy that walked in my office, the seller that owned that property, let's say if he had done an enhanced policy back when he bought that property, would that have covered that encroachment? So it would definitely cover any type of legal costs that would be involved with that encroachment. Um, you know, because as the neighboring property, they're going to be coming over maybe stating this is going to have to be moved or you're going to have to purchase this property. What are those legal costs going to look like? If an enhanced policy was issued, we would cover those legal costs to take care of those issues for the customer. So the owner of the house, if he went back to the builder and said, Hey, you know, you got, you, you built your retaining wall across the the border and I would like you to take care of this. And he would say, Nope, not going to do it. Then he would have to get an attorney and pursue that. And you're saying that Correct. the, the enhanced policy would cover the cost of the attorney to get the builder to comply. Is that what you're yes, saying? Correct. Okay, good. Just want to make sure that we're on the same page. So a lot of difference between a standard and enhanced. Um, I mentioned earlier in our sales meeting about adverse possession. And if you don't know what that means, that's whenever, if, um, a neighbor says, Hey, you can use a portion of my land or whatever to do something. And they give you permission and you do that for seven years, eight years, nine years. And then all of a sudden the neighbor decides to sell their house. 
that you have what they call adverse possession rights to continue to use that because the neighbor knew it, gave you permission and all that stuff. So, but that could be a problem that could work against you. If you're a buyer for a property and, uh, uh, and they buy a house and then the neighbor tries to claim adverse possession or something to that degree, you've got here adverse possession. So again, you're talking about legal costs. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So it covers the legal costs for that, but holy cow, a lot of different things here that it covers. So very, very interesting stuff. So Cole, did you have another question? Yes, sir. Thank you, Eric. So uh, if a person owns a home and then gets married, can they sell their property without their new spouse being on the deed to the property? This is always a fun one because in Arkansas, we still have to recognize dower and curtsy rights. So a spouse cannot sell a property without their spouse signing with them. Um, You know, let's say Billy Bob, he's in title as a married person. His wife, Sally, is not named in title. But since they're married, Sally has marital interest in the property. So regardless of her being named, she has to sign that deed to deed out her interest. And if not, later on down the road, she could legally still have interest in that property. Doing a title search, that's how we find Though those types of information, and yes, they would both have to sell the sign the deed to sell the property. So that's really interesting, I think, because we see a lot of times where a single person buys a house and then they get married and then they think, oh, well, I'm the only one that has to sign any of this stuff, but that's not Arkansas law. Uh, Correct, yeah, even if they do buy as an unmarried person when they go to sell. We have to recheck that marital status. As soon as they're married, their spouse automatically inherits marital interest in the property. So does that show up in the title search or where do you, I mean, how how do you go about doing that research whenever you're doing, so someone says, hey, I'm going to sell this house and I bring you a contract and you got that and it's only got the guy's name on it and his wife's name's not on that. How do you discover that? Most of the time, people are pretty forthcoming on their marital status. Right. Um, so up front, before we even start the title search, we're going to ask the individual, what's your marital status? Because we know if we know that up front, it's going to prevent any issues later on down the road. We're not going to have to circle back and fix issues before closing. So most of the time, people are pretty forthcoming. If not, there are usually red flags that will come up that will show whether somebody is a married individual or not. So what's the most common if you have a, I know you're doing the calculations in your mind right now, but if if you had to say this is the most common thing that we find in a title search when we're searching for, um, you know, clear title and there's not clear title because what would be the most common uh, thing that you find there? Most of the time, it is a property that was deeded with a quick claim deed, and there are additional outstanding interest previous by previous owners. That's what we see more often than not for unclear title. So we had uh, years ago, my, I've been in the business for 27 years. My father used to own the, the business, and we used to do when people would want to come here and uh, in Bella Vista where they wanted to golf. You know, we've got seven golf courses and lakes, and they wanted the membership privileges. And so they would want to buy a lot. And so we had, at that time, lots were really hard to sell. I mean, we would have 100 lots for sale in my office alone, not to mention there were, you know, probably 1,000 lots for sale. And sellers were having a hard time selling lots. So anyway, we we would sell them relatively cheap and, and a, um, uh, a buyer would say, I just want membership privileges. And so, okay, well the seller goes, yeah, I agree to sell that. Well, um, the problem comes is if they ever want to build on the lot and they want to build on the lot, then they've got to get, they've got to be able to pass clear title. And we had a deal happen. And this is when we stopped actually selling lots with a quick claim deed because the seller, when he came here years ago, Cooper Homes that developed Bella Vista, they brought people in on these little three-day vacations, and then they would put them under the gun and say, hey, you need to buy this lot. And so they bought this lot, but they were here with two other families. And so there were three of them that bought the lot together. And keep in mind, this was back in the 70s or 80s. And so the guy that wanted to, or the person that wanted to sell the lot was one owner, but there were two other owners, and they were both passed away. So you got to go to the heirs, you got to go to all this thing. Anyway, long story short is that the person could buy the lot. I mean, the quick claim deed was fine. They had membership privileges, but they could not build on the lot and they could not pass the lot with title insurance 
Correct. And I mean, and that kind of circles back to, you know, what is title insurance? We do have two different types. We have an owner's policy and then there's a lender's policy. So when someone goes to build and they're getting a loan on that uh, property, that's when the lender's policy comes into place because that is protecting the lender's interest in that property because they technically own that asset whenever you have a mortgage on it. So that we have ran into that before where people go to build and they can't because they bought it with a quick claim deed. They don't have clear title. And now we're having to work through trying to clear that title so they can get a loan to right. build. And it could take time. Absolutely. Trying to communicate with, you know, people that their heirs that, you know, the, the original buyer, buyer passed away and then their kids got the inheritance and exactly. sometimes they didn't even know it and yep. agreeing to sign something. I'm not going to sign anything. And so anyway, I will tell you as a realtor that we highly recommend getting title insurance and not transferring property by quick claim deeds for the very reasons that we were talking about. Well, let me ask you, let's talk about costs because um, buyers are always concerned about costs. And a lot of times they get to the closing table and part of this is the realtor's fault that we don't disclose. We need to disclose, Cole, I'm talking, I'm a principal broker, Cole's my agent. So I'm talking to you. We need to disclose what costs the the buyer is going can expect. And so you've got the loan. They've talked to a, a, a lender. The lender's given them their closing costs. And sometimes they include in all of the other costs, whatever. But you get the closing table and they're like, oh, what is this? And so other th- so tell me, first of all, I've got a three hundred thousand dollar house. I know you mentioned a hundred thousand dollar, but that's not real realistic in today's society. You have a three hundred dollar a three hundred thousand dollar house. Approximately what would the the buyer um, again? And I know there's different scenarios, but let's just say they're splitting it 50-50, You know, with the with the seller. So, so what would be the cost of a three hundred thousand dollars owner's policy, and then the buyer's portion would be half of that? So, could you answer that? Yeah. So, I mean, they're looking at I would say a little over five hundred dollars okay. for the actual policy itself. Their half or the whole policy? Their half. The okay. whole policy for a 300000 you're looking at a little over $1,000. So ballpark around a little over $1,000. Yeah, for okay. the total amount. So split okay. 50-50, a little over $500 for that. But then you also have to take into play the cost of the title search itself. So you have to consider that, which for us at Waco, you know, that's around two fifty dollars per side if okay. it's split 50-50. And then you have to consider the actual closing costs for the settlement closing fee. Um, and that's roughly about $350. Um, and again, that's per client, right? Per so side, buyer yes. pays three fifty, dollars seller, seller pays, pays $350. $350. Okay, gotcha. Yep. And of course, we run into some situations where sellers want to cover all costs, buyer want to cover all costs. But yeah, that's $50.50. Um, and then recording fees. So you have to think of recording the deed. And so that's roughly around $25. It's based off of how many pages the deed is. So if there's multiple sellers, um, let's say that we have to send it to four or five different people to sign. Of course, that's going to increase just a little bit. Um, But as the buyer, just for title purposes, those are the fees that you're looking at. So uh, maybe the listeners don't know. I know what it is, and maybe you guys do. I'm sure you do. Um, Arkansas revenue stamps. What in the world are revenue stamps? And is that also one of their costs? Yes, that is a cost. So that is the transfer tax that the government likes to collect anytime a property is transferred. So I always refer to it uh, to, to try to help buyers understand. When you mail a letter, you always put a stamp on your letter. Yes. And that's a requirement. You can't just stick it in the the mailbox and expect it to get delivered without a stamp on it. Well, whenever we record deeds at the courthouse, they have these little stamps on there and they're three dollars and thirty cents per thousand. Isn't that correct? correct? Okay. And typically the buyer and the seller split the total cost of that. So Cole, today you've got a closing and you'll see on there you know the revenue stamps and then the buyer pays usually half and the seller pays for half of that. But it's three dollars and thirty cents per thousand. So if it's a you know um a thousand dollars, three dollars thirty cents. But if it's a hundred thousand dollars, it's three hundred and thirty dollars. And then that would be split. So you know you exactly. just go on up. So anyway, but that's some of the things that buyers don't calculate. Whenever yes. they're doing that. And I don't know if you've ever been had a closing where a buyer walked in and goes, what are these fees? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's a little bit, uh, you don't want that at closing. So you usually yep. want to do that. Cole, did you have any other questions? Yes, sir. Thank you, Eric. Um, so are there any advantages to a split co- uh, closing if the other party to the contract is using another title company? So most of the time, 
closing at the same title company is the best case scenario. You know, we know that everybody has their own preference of who they would prefer to use. Um, but advantages for a split closing, I would say there's almost more cons than pros. Let's just be honest here. Um, because you've got wires you have to worry about. Um, if they're agreeing to split cost 50, 50, you can't necessarily do that when it's a split closing. So you have to take those costs into consideration whenever you're looking at a split closing for a customer. Um, sometimes it depends on, are you helping the buyer or, or are you advocating for the seller? You know, what's those costs look like? on both sides. But yeah, I would honestly say there's a little more cons to a split than closing at the same title company. So Angelina, I'm going to agree with you. Um, and I have a theory, which I, I of course think that my theory is correct, but years ago we never did split closings. I mean, I've been in the business for 27 years and we, the seller would always, because the seller, there's an owner's policy of title and the seller is the one providing clear title to the buyer. And so they would say, here's the title company that I want to use because I used them last time. And so they would say, I'm going to use this title company. And the buyer goes, okay, we're going to use it. And I have discovered that most buyers and sellers, even sellers, if they've bought the properties, maybe two or three with that, they don't really either have a preference or they don't really understand the whole, you know, what's a title company and why do I, you know, they don't really, they just want to close. They just want to sell their house. Seller wants to get their money, buyer wants to buy the house. So I, it's been my experience. I've been doing this a long time that buyers and sellers really don't know. And most of the time don't care, but we noticed somewhere 10, 15 years ago, probably 10 years ago that we started seeing some split closings. Well, I noticed a correlation between that time period and when real estate companies were buying title companies. Yes, we do see that a lot. And yeah. so if a real estate company owns a title company, guess what? They're probably going to recommend that their client uses that title company. Now the buyer may say, Hey, I want to use Waco or my realtor is recommending that we use Waco because they give an enhanced title policy, right? You know, right from the, the get go and the seller or the seller, he doesn't know, doesn't care, but his realtor is recommending this title company because they own a certain title company. So I started seeing that happen as real estate companies started buying out these title companies that we started seeing a whole lot more split closing. Didn't see them before. And all of a sudden we started seeing them. And so in my opinion, and again, this is a podcast, it's my podcast. So I have a lot of, a lot of opinions, but it's been my opinion that it, if you've ever played that game called rumor, you know, where you go around and you go, Hey, Cole, you know, Jack jumped over the, the candlestick. And you go say that. Jack, and he says that to Jennifer. Jennifer says that to Angelina. And the more people you have, the more convoluted that that little message gets. And at the very end, it's like, um, you know, Jackson jumped over a football goal or something. I mean, you know, it's like it comes out totally different because you've got more people involved that are saying the same thing, but the people that are hearing it are hearing it differently and then they tell it differently. And so when you have that problem, that happens also in real estate. The more people, the more that you have involved in the transaction, sometimes it gets convoluted. And for the seller to get paid quickly, especially if you've got a seller's got one title company and the buyer has another title company, there can be a problem in the seller getting paid at closing. Exactly. Especially we run into this on Fridays. <laughs> so if it's a Friday afternoon, and let's say that the buyers are closing at another title company, <coughs> we have the seller. We have to be very sure that we've communicated with the seller, you might not receive your funds today. And a lot of sellers are not thrilled about that because they think as soon as I sign, I'm going to walk away with my money or I'm going to receive a wire within the next hour or so with my funds for this property. So that is a downside whenever you have two different title companies that are working on the same transaction is you have to time those closings out almost perfect with each other to make sure that everybody gets paid in a timely manner and people aren't going over the weekend without receiving their funds. Yeah, it's a great point. And we've covered this in our podcast before that the closing by definition of the contract says that when everybody has signed all the paperwork, the deeds, the warranty deed, the settlement statement, all the paperwork, the loan costs, all the paperwork, and the seller has received purchase price funds. And it does say the closing agent of the seller could have received those. But I will tell you that I've had this happen before and Friday afternoon closings at four o'clock, for instance, Cole's got a closing today at four o'clock. 
sometimes if you've got two title companies involved, the seller st- or the buyer's title company has the money, but they have to wire it. And then what is it, three o'clock or so that you can't do wiring? Yes, it's a cutoff about three o'clock. And some of them have an earlier cutoff of about two, two thirty. So ours is three. Sometimes we can squeak them by before three thirty. But yeah, there's a cutoff. And then it's in limbo until the yep. next day, right? And if exactly. it's on a Friday, Saturday and Sunday are not business days. And it's Monday before the seller gets paid. And sometimes the seller's not real happy about that. And sometimes we have to do rent. We've charged the buyer. Or yes. sometimes the seller goes, sorry, I, you can't get into my house until I receive the money. And we've had a lot of sticky situations. So we've actually started closing more on Thursdays. And you've probably seen Thursday closings bump up instead of Fridays after they change that on the contract with the, you know, the closing requiring the, the, purchase, the seller to have purchase price funds. So anyway, well, hey, guys, we're drawing close to our uh, end time for our podcast. But Cole, I believe you had some one final question that you wanted to ask. Yes, sir. Thank you, Eric. So I just wanted to ask you guys, so what is the, like the craziest experience you guys have experienced before being in the title company business? So I have just a funny story. I know Jennifer probably has a ton, but I was sitting in a closing one time with a customer and the property belonged to a deceased person. Their family was selling it. Um, they were clearing the yard out. There was a ton of leaves and they looked at us and they said, we found three bodies in the yard. And we were like, bodies. Okay, can you please clarify exactly what you're talking about? And there were three boxes of ashes that had been buried. And I guess just from sitting in the yard, they kind of became uncovered. Um, The agent ended up grabbing them and driving around we kept teasing him saying he was driving around with bodies in his truck truck. (laughs) and kept telling him we're gonna call on you because you're driving around with bodies in your trunk but yeah that was probably the craziest thing that i had heard during a closing that they found that while cleaning the yard up well thanks angelina and jennifer for visiting our podcast today hey if you are listening today and you think that you are ready to start looking for your next home or you are a seller and looking to sell your home, we have 23 experienced agents ready and willing to help you in your next real estate transaction. You can always reach out to us at info at hutchrealty.com or you can just go to our website at hutchrealty.com where you can view every active listing in Northwest Arkansas, or you can get a free automated home evaluation. If you need help with title on your property, or you need help in closing a real estate transaction, I want to recommend our friends over at Waco Title Company. They are great to work with, and you can go to their website at wacotitle.com, and you can choose which office to work with. They have offices in Bella Vista, Bentonville, Rogers, Springdale, and Fayetteville. If you like this podcast, don't forget to leave us a positive review and come back next week when we will continue talking about Northwest Arkansas real estate. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.